I'm not important. Our guest speaker is important. His name is Dan Orsini. And I'm going to call Dan up in a minute. First, I want to give you a little background. I'm going to try and give you a model of how you should open up your own personal interview. I'm going to try not to screw it up. I do not have a script. So I'm just going to kind of let the questions flow. And at this point in time, I'd like to call Dan Orsini up. Dan, would you like to sit down for a minute? Sure. And I'll ask you a couple questions. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of open up the interview. I'll ask a couple of uh, general questions, and I'll ask a specific question or two. And what I'm trying to do right now is model for my students how to conduct their own interviews, <coughs> which they're going to be carrying out probably the rest of this month. So. And this is the first time that they've actually had a World War II veteran in this class. We've been going since September here. Our class actually ends in January. Part of their project is, uh, if you remember, I sent one of my students over, Shane Kolar, a few years ago to interview you. Yeah. Uh, he had to interview you, and that's what these folks have to do for their own person. Then they have to kind of write a paper about where their person fits in the whole picture of World War II. So we're trying to get a little background information here. They'll be doing their own videotape. So usually what I start out with is I, I uh, identify myself on the tape. So now I'm going to start the interview. Uh, today's date is December 2nd, 2010. My name is Matthew Rosell. I'm here at Hudson Falls High School. It's about 1.10 in the afternoon. And I'm here with Dan Orsini. Dan Orsini is a World War II veteran. And he's originally from Glens Falls. Am I right about that? Mm -hmm. South Glens Falls. He's from South Glens Falls. Big mistake. So right now I'm going to ask him a couple of questions. And uh, then I'll let Dan just take it and run with it. And then we'll see what, what questions you guys have. Um, so, Dan, can you tell me, uh, what's your date of birth? <clears throat> May 29, 1920. May 29, 1920. And you said you were born in South Glens Falls? Born in South Glens Falls. Now, your family, was it a big family? Uh, no, not really, no. Um, my father emigrated from Italy in the late 1800s. Came over here and met my mother in Brooklyn, and then they moved. Glens Falls and made it to South Glens Falls where I had a couple of uncles. But my family grew up after that. Now, um, that would make you 90 years old now? I'm 90 years old. 90 years young. Big party, May 29th. I heard about that party, I think. Now, you have, uh, you have some brothers and sisters too, right? Oh, yeah. I have a brother, Frank, who was a Marine. He passed away a year ago. God bless the guy. He was a great Marine. I have another brother, Nick, who was a colonel in the Air Force, Korean War. I have a sister, Joyce, who was a registered nurse at Mass General in Boston, Massachusetts. Those are my brothers and my sister. Uh, are they all except Frank still? Alive? Yeah, they're alive. Yeah. My sister lives in Maine. She's married, has children. My brother, Nick, has got four children. Married, lives in Queensbury. And uh, so we're moving around. So, are you, were you the oldest? I was the oldest. And did you, I'm trying to remember, did you say that you grew up in South Las Vegas? Yeah. And you grew up, you were born in 1920, so you were pretty much a teenager during the Great Depression. Oh yeah, I was. Do you, re, do you remember what that was like? Well, you know where St. Mary is in Glens Falls? I lived in South Glens Falls. No school buses, no car, all kinds of weather. Left Southlands Falls in the morning, 7.30, walk to St. Mary's. 11.30, walk back home for lunch. Back at 1 o'clock, back at 4 o'clock. Remember, no transportation. We did that. All of us who lived in Southlands Falls had to make that. Who went to St. Mary's had to make that move. That was tough. That was during the Depression. My father was a second-hand, like a shoemaker. He had a shoe store and a shoe, shoe shop. He sold new shoes and he repaired older ones. You know, he was a businessman. He was pretty good at it. From a guy, or a guy who emigrated from Italy, he did pretty well over here. My mother worked at McMullen Levins uh, in Glens Falls, which is now some kind of a church factory. I'm not sure what it is, but that's where she worked. Was that a factory or? It was McMullen Levins factory. They made shirts, 
of all the elite people in the world. And that was a long, long throughout the whole of the United States, that particular area. And uh, what was the other question you asked? So we're trying to get a feel for what it was like to grow up during the Great Depression. Oh, yeah. That's what it was. Uh, the, 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 the Depression area was, was difficult. You got to, you know, you look back, I look back, no telephone, no TV, uh, hardly any communications unless, unless you wrote a letter. It took four weeks to get from here to Chicago, I mean, one of those things. And the food wasn't like, you, know, you go to Hannaford, you got a new world. We had a, a small grocery store where I lived in Southland Falls. You know, you walk inside and my mother was, uh, you know, they all were uh, tough shoppers. My mother would walk in there and she'd get enough just for the four of us, five of us, whatever that was. And uh, that's how they operated those days, close close to the belt, you know. The money was scarce, nobody had a big job, and they depended on one another. The neighbors were very neighborly. Like I say, no telephone, no TV, and all this other stuff. So growing up in the Depression was bad, but it was good in another way because it gave us a chance, and I got older, to appreciate what I was getting against what I had. I had no bicycle when I was a kid. And like I say, we walked to St. Mary's every day. The people who ran St. Mary's, the nuns, they felt sorry for us because they knew we had to walk two and a half miles, about ten miles every day, or or you know, not do it. No, that was our, it was tough during the depression. No question about it. So, did your family have their own house, or mm -hmm. did you rent, or did you own? Your no, house? my father bought his house. Yeah, uh, he rented it for the first two years, but then after all, after a while, he decided to. Uh, uh, buy. And like I say, the business was such, he had an arrangement with the bank, it was the First National Bank at the time, to make mortgage payments and all that. I think it took 22 years before he went house. <clears throat> now, did, um, was there another school in South Buns Falls? Oh, yes. Yeah. Decided they wanted you to go to the Catholic school? No, it was my mother. Your mother? My mother and father. We were Catholic, so just, you know, you better go to St. Mary's. They have to pay tuition for that. No. <clears throat> no, no, just getting us over there and getting us home. So I spent. I was the only one. My brother Frank went to St. Mary's for two years, but I went there twelve years. My brother Nick and my brother Frank started out when I was a senior at St. Mary's. They started out at South High. Yeah, okay. that's, that's where they went. I grabbed. Let me tell them. Sure, go ahead. I graduated from St. Mary's in 1938. That's 72 years ago. And your grandparents weren't even born then. Uh, after I graduated, no jobs around. That was the Depression. Young guy, could, I sold a post star in a street corner for a nickel to make some money. And I was pretty good at it then, but I went all over the damn place to sell that post star. Uh, was that your first job? That was my first job. Yeah. About two weeks after I graduated, I got another job at the NBC Bakery, which was on Sagamore Street in Glens Falls. I had it from 12 to 7. That only lasted two weeks before they, they decided to move the store or something. So three of us lost our jobs. So there were no, there were no jobs around. It was a tough, tough time. So I said, i got to get some more education. So I went to, I checked South High out. I went to South High, took a business course, business arithmetic, typing, and uh, one other course. I forget what, another business course, anyway. Three business courses, and when I was there, I played all the sports. Basketball, football, baseball, everything. And uh, I liked South High very much. And the next year, after I left South High, times were still tough couldn't get a job. Three of us decided, we've got to do something with our lives. What are we going to do? And one of the guys said, why don't we go into the service? Okay. So we hopped in his car, drove to Albany, I think it was 9 and 10 o'clock in the morning, came back at 2.30 in the afternoon. I'm a U.S. Marine. He's a U.S. You know, the guy that drove with a U.S. Coast Guardman, and the other guy wound up in the Navy. 
all of a sudden we're in the service. That's how my service career began. Now, I can continue? Yeah. Uh -huh. They sent me to Paris Island, South Carolina, for my boot training. Twelve tough, tough weeks, believe me. So after the boot, boot training, I expected to be sent to Camp Lejeune or Camp Pendleton for further Marine training until somebody walked in there with a lot of stripes. He said, I want to talk with you. Come here a minute. No. He said, I see by your resume here, you know how to type. I took me by surprise. Type? Yeah, I can type. What the hell did I got to do with my Marine training? He said, step in here. So I went to the office and he said, now that you can type, sit down and type that letter. Uh, like I was telling the other group, these ty typewriters with the old Remington, and plunk, 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 you know, a lot of those things. No electricity, no old machines. But he liked what he saw, the way I typed. And I must have done a good job because he said, just a minute, he walked into another room, two guys came back. We're going to send you to Washington, D.C. What the hell am I going to do in Washington, D.C.? No idea. Yeah, don't forget them. I'm 20 years old. I got to Washington, D.C. They sent me to the Marine Corps Institute, which is a correspondence school for Marines. High tech college type thing. And while I was there, this was early 1941, about two weeks after I was in Washington, D.C., just getting settled, they called me and they said, you've been selected to serve in the White House Honor Guard. Again, yeah, 20 years old, what the hell? What are they doing to me? Send me to Washington, D.C. Now I'm in the White House Honor Guard. Must have impressed somebody. I don't know, maybe it was the uniform. Anyway, all of a sudden, I mean, my life changes. So, I forget now, this is 1941, almost two years, almost two years before Pearl Harbor. I had an opportunity to attend FDR's inauguration, a the photo of that there. In January of 1941, he was uh, uh, sworn in as president. I went to his inaugural parade up and down Pennsylvania Avenue, went to his inaugural ball at Mayflower Hotel, sat at the same table with Mickey Looney. He was then with a young kid, a famous actor. He was probably the most famous actor in the world in 1941. Followed up with the Angel Hardy series, and he wound up with that movie, Black Stallion, a great, great movie. And by the way, he just turned 90 this year also. He's yeah. still alive? Uh -huh. Brody's still yeah. alive? Yeah, I, uh, yeah. That's that Mickey Rooney. He sat at the table with Mickey Rooney. He sat at the same table with Mickey Rooney? Well, he sat, let me put it this way. I was seated at the table with Supreme Court Justice <coughs> Felix Frankfurter and his wife. And two other gentlemen whose names that escaped me, and another Marine and I, and this young kid comes, Mind if I join you? Mickey Rooney. He sat at the same table with us. Yeah. <laughs> what a character he was. Can I pass this around so you guys can see it? They, that, I was a lieutenant at that time. Yeah. Uh, so during 1941, I was able to, after the inauguration of FDR, I went. To, on several events with FDR, he dedicated the Jefferson Memorial in Washington, D.C. I was there for that. I have a photo of that. He dedicated the uh, Naval Hospital in Bethesda, Maryland. I was there for that. I made two trips to, to Warm Springs, Georgia with the President. That was a little White House at the time. That's where he died. I know the chair he died in. I see him sitting there many times. FDR had a long cigarette thing, that hat, a little dog, a fella at his side, you know. So I know when I heard he had died, I was on board ship going to the South Pacific, felt bad about it. I knew exactly where he was when he died. I think he died happy, you know, except that we were in the middle of the war. Yeah, the problem. But he, was, he made some good decisions while he was president. December the 8th, December the 7th, Pearl Harbor, December the 8th, the next day, they called us, they said we're a bunch of, I think 20 of us, 20 Marines were Thank scheduled to go. Let me interrupt you just one second. Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but getting back to December 7th, one of the questions I'm going to ask that 
kids here to ask their people. And I know you're going to tell them, where were you and what were you doing when you heard the news of Pearl Harbor? Okay. <coughs> On December the 7th, at 9 o'clock in the morning, I was at the U.S. Naval Hospital, the U.S. Naval War College in Washington, D.C., playing basketball. We played, we were playing the Navy and Marines. About the third quarter of the game, they interrupted the game. They said, we want you to know that Pearl Harbor had just been bombed. Okay. What are we going to do? Now, the only thing we can do is finish the game. Nothing we can do at that point. So we finished the game. And that was the beginning of a new life for a lot of us because everything changed. Don't forget, I was a sergeant major. I, I was allowed to carry a 45. No, no, not loaded. I just carried it. After that date, everything that I carried was, I had a load of 45 on me, but those were Sergeant Major. The other guys carried, carried rifles. Um, December the 8th, the next day, they told us that we had to go to the House of Representatives to listen to FDR. He was going to address the world. And he did. That was the day he gave his famous Day of Infamy speech. I have a photo of it there someplace. I was about 100 yards, I don't know, about 100 feet on his, on his left from where he was. And that was the most moving speech I think I've ever heard anybody give. Because he was telling the world, we've been bombed, we're going to win this war. And the famous, see where I have it? Yeah. Where I have it underlined, so help us God. So help us God. Yeah. I'll never forget that because that's been questioned over the years. A lot of people, tonight, they don't believe. He said he never used the word God, but he did. I was there, I heard it, there's proof of it right there. How many people were there? Yeah. Oh, a lot of people there? Uh, maybe, oh, maybe two or three thousand. They filled that whole U.S. House of Representatives looking up. They wouldn't let everybody in, they let me. Yeah. So they wheeled the president down, and that's when he gave his uh, uh, Day of Infamy speech. And uh, all hell broke loose after that. This guy, the president, he was very, very emotional very upset to think that the America had been bombed like they were. Some historians say, well, he knew it all then. No way. The president had no idea. And he was just as upset as I was and everybody else. So he, he decided that at that point that he'd take the reins of the country. Well, this is the war that we were in. It was a war that we had to win. And he did it. And he People like Winston Churchill and other countries like that, England, all got together, formed the Allies, and uh, they had a great plan to win that war. It would be that. Yeah. So, what was the next step for you after that? After the December 8th? Yeah, as a Marine. Well, as a Marine, okay. Uh, that, was, that was December 1941. Well, I went to, or I was still in Washington, D.C., so I went to four or five different things with FDR, including two or three trips to Warm Springs, Georgia, where he had to get away from Washington every five or six weeks, otherwise he'd drive me crazy. Can I, ask you, can I ask you about Warm Springs? Yeah. Now, Warm Springs, Georgia, you folks know that the president was afflicted with polio. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, he liked to swim. Uh, Did you ever see him yes. swim? Yes. So I'm glad you asked that question. When I was a member of the White House Guard, I had a couple of friends in the, in the Secret Service. We became friends, you know. They saw me often and I saw them often. They knew I had a good rank, Sergeant Major, so they respected my rank. And uh, one day, uh, one of the, Victor, uh, Victor, I don't know his last name, Victor, he was a Secret Service agent. Hey, Stan, come here. Oh, he called me over and said, the President's going to be in his pool in about 10 minutes in case you want to see him swim. I didn't even know the guy went in the pool. Boy, this, you, nobody ever got to see the president in the pool. I'll tell you, that was a, a moment for me that I'll never forget. I looked down and I saw this guy, he was struggling a little bit. He was just getting off that chair that they had in the pool. He was doing this for exercise more than anything else. And a little fella was standing next to him barking like hell, a little dog. <laughs> so that was the pool. And I saw him swimming in. And uh, I, I never told many people about that because I would think that that was something special between the Secret Service and I. I tell the story now because it's all over, but 
but there are not too many people ever saw FDR swimming in a school. Yeah. Well, they didn't even know he was in a wheelchair half the American public, it seems. Yeah. They weren't even sure he was in a wheelchair. Oh, I know, that's right, Joe. A lot of people didn't know that. They did that while well. they covered it real well. Every time uh, the president's going to speak, all of a sudden, you, the mic goes on and he's right there. They don't show the wheelchair being pushed in. James Roosevelt was his son, and he was a major in the Marine Corps. So he kind of took exceptions to me because I was a sergeant major. Of all the Marine White House Guards, I was a senior member. So uh, Jim Roosevelt came in and said, Dan, I want you to do this, and I want you to do that. And, you know. So he kind of looked forward to picking me out of the crowd, so to speak, and asking me to do things. You know, I appreciated that. Did you ever get to talk to the president? Me? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Talk to the president at that tree lighting. I don't know if I told you about that. Oh. Christmas tree lighting yet? Tell us. Tell okay. us. December the 24th, 1941. They had the Christmas tree lighting on the South Lawn, which was to be the last tree lighting for the duration of the war. I was one of 18 Marines in this in an alcove waiting for the president to go by. And what I didn't know is, when he went by, he stuck his hand out. He said, hi, Sergeant, how are you? I always remember, he knew those six stripes. Hi, Mr. President. And he says, this is Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill was right behind him. Winston Churchill had come to America to talk for two or three days with the president. And he shook it. He said, uh, Merry Christmas, Sergeant, to me. Winston Churchill. I met two world leaders in less than a minute. FDR and Winston Churchill. I said, Whoa! How many? How old am I anyway? <laughs> how old were you? Really, like twenty-one? Maybe twenty, right? I was uh, twenty-one. I was twenty-one. And met two world leaders. Yeah. And now I didn't even tell my parents that for a while. Nobody would believe me. <laughs> so anyway, uh, that was the last tree lighting until after the war. Now they do it every year. And they're going to continue doing it, whether we're at war or not. Now I understand it. It's going to be a tradition. Yeah. Now, uh, so that 1941 through 19, when all these things with FDR, and went to Bethesda, Maryland with them, and a couple of other functions I can't even remember. There are so many. Because when you're in Washington and you're one of 31 of us, Marine Guard, at the White House, they call you every day. I didn't go there every day, but boy, I was there two or three times a week. And uh, I was honored to be there, a little kid in South Fence Wallace. And I wonder how am I doing over here? So when that guy called me in to do that typing for him, now I realized what And then I knew it was time for me to go overseas. I've been squawking about that all along. You wanted to go overseas? Oh, yeah. I, a year before that, I had put in. But I was in the Marine Guard. They said, no, you can't go now. You're part of this contingent, you know. Why did you want to go? Everybody else was going to war. And uh, my, my brother was in Guadalcanal. You get shot at Joe Fiore from Glens Falls. Yeah. You're, 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 you're the coach, Tony Luciano. God bless him. Tony Luciano was there. He's too young to remember him. He's your coach here at Hudson Paul. Luciano Lane. Luciano Invitational. Yeah. Coach Luce is my coach. Yeah. 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 I don't care, we want you to be a second lieutenant. So they can't argue with the bosses, so they sent me to Quantico for 16 weeks. I became a second lieutenant. I said, good, now that I got my bars, they're going to send me overseas. They called me into the office. They said, we can't send you overseas. You've got to be, you got to stay at Quantico as a machine gun instructor. Oh, machine gun instructor? They said, yeah, you had a good rank as a, as a machine gun person, so we're going to keep you here. No way. And what, what are my options? Well, you can either have a general court-martial because you're refusing to take an order, or you can resign your commission. 
and we'll give you your sergeant major the rating back. It took me five minutes to make that decision. I resigned my commission and I retained my sergeant major's rating. And two days later, two days later, I'm on my boat, I'm on the train headed to the West Coast to meet my first Marine division. That's where I wanted to go all along. I was the happiest guy in the world. I wanted to be with the guys I wanted to be with. And that's how my, all my, I didn't talk about why I'm in Okinawa yet. Not yet, but you're, um, I'm interested to know why you were, you were trained on the machine gun? You were an expert on the machine gun? No, I was a sharpshooter in the machine gun. There were three basic sharpshooter experts. What gun was it? 50 caliber Thompson machine gun. It was an old, you know, type machine gun. And when I was firing it, I enjoyed it, you know, just like everything else. I became an expert in the rifle, uh, sharpshooter with the uh, machine gun. But I never thought in this world that I was going to be told I'd have to stay in Quantico to instruct other Marines. You didn't want any part of oh, that? Oh, I wanted no part of that at all. It was an insult. I had, a, I was the lieutenant for Christ's sake. Hey, I went there to, you know, become an officer, and I did. Uh, needless to say, o over the years, a lot of people had come to me, and they said, you made a good decision. You retained your Sergeant Major rating bank, which I had to be. I think I was the youngest Sergeant Major in the Marine Corps ever had, at 22, I think I was. And when I was young to be a Sergeant Major. But anyway. Uh, so now you're on the train, and you're heading towards the West Coast? I'm on a train heading towards the West Coast. Got to... Uh, Camp Pendleton on the West Coast. I knew my next trip would be overseas on a boat. But I had a week to spend in Washington, D.C., in uh, Camp Pendleton, California. One night, they gathered, they gathered a group of us. They said, well, we're going to go to the Hollywood Canteen tonight. I had never heard about the place. I found out about it the hard way. I pulled a little show there. Uh, I went to the Hollywood Canteen met a lot of movie stars. Betty Davis, number one. I danced with Betty Grable. Ingrid Bergman was there. Janice Page, all famous movie stars. And we had a ball, myself and a bunch of, a bunch of Marines. Who is this? That's Betty Grable. <coughs> Betty Grable? Yeah. You guys familiar with Betty Grable? Mm -hmm. yeah. And you said, who else? You were with... Uh, Let's show the movie star pictures first. Then I'll go back and I'll show the yep. camera pictures. And then you guys can look at them later. Who is this, Nan? Well, Ingrid Bergman, movie Casablanca. Yes. Uh, did you dance with her? Oh, yeah. I danced with, with Ingrid. I danced with all the ladies there that night. Called the ladies. That was her, that was her thing. Who is this? That's Janice Page. She's the one that. Don't forget, I was young. I was 20 years, 22 years old. And she said, uh, I'm going to be at Warner Brothers Studio tomorrow <coughs> posing for some photos. Would you come along? But you got to go to baby school. <laughs> <laughs> you got to be kidding. I said, they, they, they dressed me up in that. And they just, I put on a baby suit and had some photos taken with her. I understand Warner Brothers used them in some, you know, whatever. <laughs> 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 No big deal. No, this, uh, big deal. Right. <laughs> Who's this guy with the uh, artificial coconuts? Uh, <laughs> Benny Davis called me up on stage because once a month, oh, again, the Sergeant Major, they, they didn't pay attention to the one strike or two strikes. They saw me. You know, we wanted him up here, you know. So uh, Benny Davis came to you mind if we dressed you as a girl? Wow. No. So first, first Westmore was there. First Westmore happened to be the the makeup artist for Warner Brothers. He did all the stars. And first Westmore there. He, he, he dressed he dressed Betty Davis up as a man, Roger Marks, and dressed me up as a baby. That's <laughs> Betty Davis. A beautiful kid, isn't it? Is that you? Yeah, that's me. Oh, yeah. I'm not really broad, I was. <laughs> that sit around. <laughs> so anyway, after Camp Hamilton was over, oh, I'm going to... I want to, don't want to leave you in the, up in the air, but the next day was uh, Easter Sunday, and 
a group of us were told we were going to go to the Hollywood Bowl for the sunrise services at the Hollywood Bowl. You've all seen on TV with a big sign on top of the mountain, Hollywood, the bowl is right there. Almost 30,000 people. That's where I was. That there, that photo. That's the photo of the, that Easter Sunday morning. 30,000 people were in that picture. And that was up here somewhere with about 12 Marines. What a fantastic thing that was. And that was the last good thing that happened before I went overseas. So is this 1942 or 43? Uh, 43. 43. 43. 43. Yeah. You guys can look at this book out. Dan Lawler, the guy that, you know, he was, he and I were there. So, just to interrupt for a second. Last time we were together, I told you that I was contacted by two other um, soldiers. One was Dan Lawler, 1st Marine Division. He knows him very well. Oh, yeah. And the other one was Floyd Dumas, the man who escaped. He was in the Army. He escaped in Italy for the Army. Oh, you don't miss his story. Floyd Dumas is one real... You got a story. You got to hear it. This guy, I don't want to steal any of his thunder, but don't miss his story. He's a POW. He went off to all kinds of torture. He escaped two or three times. They brought him back. He escaped again. He spent about a year hiding in Italy, thanks to some Italian friends that he made. And he's got a, they made a movie out of this. And you might be able to see it when he comes. Yeah. Great, great guy. He turned 90 years old this year. He and I, and a guy whose name is Dave Sexton in South Glens Falls, all turned 90, and we, out, we had a ball at Carl Arnold's in Glens Falls. Mm -hmm. We had a big lunch, a lot of drinks and all that stuff, you know. Dave Sexton is another guy. Was he over too? Oh, yeah. Dave Sexton, he's my, my hero. Let me tell you what happened to him quickly. He's not part of this. He's Dave Sexton lives in South Glens Falls, 11, 11 Lydia's if you ever want to send him anything. Don't tell him I told you that. <laughs> anyway, Dave Sexton was in the United States Army when uh, they, uh, the Battle of uh, when in, in England, not the Battle of Bulge, D-Day. D-Day. He was wounded going to shore on D-Day, Dave Sexton was. The Graves Registration people came along and they, there were a, a 14 dead American soldiers on this truck. One guy came along and gave him the final, you know, check it out. And this guy was breathing. It was Dave Sexton. He was still breathing. They pulled him up from under 12 or 15 guys. He spent six months in the hospital in England. Uh, needless to say, his all around and his leg were all shredded. And I've never seen him. You know, I, I've seen him myself, but no, no people who don't know him don't realize how badly he was hurt. But he doesn't talk about it too much, you know. But he's very sensitive about where he was, what he went through. And I tried to, but he did go to that 90th birthday I'm talking about. He likes Floyd. He likes Floyd a lot. Oh, geez, maybe you two should get together and come in from Floyd. <laughs> but anyway, Dave Sexton, in my, in my opinion, a real, real hero. Uh, he, he killed a lot of um, the enemy before he was wounded, you know. Yeah. But uh, to be thrown on the truck with a bunch of dead people, and then <coughs> to me, that was determined that he was still breathing two hours later. You know, all shot up with my dog. Um, that's the section in South Glen's Fall. <coughs> so when you were in Camp Pendleton, you went to the Hollywood Bowl, and then what was after that, 1943? So like Easter 1943 then, right? That was, uh, no, that was 1944. Eastern. Oh, that was the yeah. Hollywood Bowl? Yeah, that was 1944. So and now, before, then I'm on my way overseas. Now you're on your way overseas. But before I go there, I want to back up a minute. I mentioned, I mentioned going to Luciano. Yeah. What was the other one I'm going to mention? Oh, I was here recently when you had your uh, honors, your Hall of Fame. Uh, that was a great event. And uh, I was talking with Heather back there. I know, I know her mom, by the way. Her mom worked for Betty Little. I'm in that office every morning. I see her mom. She's a great 
lady, lady. Don't tell her I said that. <laughs> <laughs> she is, does a great job with Betty Little. I'm there every morning. Uh, and, uh, oh, at that, the day that you had that induction of the Hall of Fame, by the way, you had some nice people inducted that way, that day. It just so happens that my granddaughter, Michaela, was selected as a member of the honor, National Honor Society, same day. So I wanted to mention that before we went any further, because she was, I was really proud of her, proud of all you guys that made the honor, uh, honor society. Great, great thing, great feat. And congratulate all you people who were members of that. You can do a great, it's a great thing to get involved. It really is. And, uh, Hudson Falls is a great place to be from, and I, I learned a lot about Hudson Falls more when I went to that Hall of Fame and see all those nice people that they honored. Wow! I mean, you got to stop and think about that. I was honored recently in Southland Falls. I got elected to the Hall of Fame in South High. I went through the same thing, not quite as elaborate as what you guys had, but uh, I was honored to think that anybody thought of me as being a Hall of Fame person. I never. So much love that. Weren't you the uh, Grand Marshal for the parade? Yeah, I was the great one. Yeah. He came to me and he said, we'd like to have you the Glens Falls National Bank. I'm on their regional board. I've been there. I'm the senior member now. Yost. So Tom Hoy, who's the president, came to me. Danny said, I'd like to have you be the Grand Marshal of the Holiday Parade in South Glens Falls. Why? Why me? I, I've been in a lot of parades. Never mind. Don't ask any questions. You're going to be the Grand Marshal. Okay, so that was the Grand Marshal of the Holiday Parade over there last week, December the, on November the 21st, the, the, the Sunday before Thanksgiving. 25,000 people came to see that parade. I don't know if any of you, any of you people had it or not, but <coughs> I have my great grandchildren, four of them, with me, and my granddaughter, Jamie, who's a math teacher at South High. She wanted to be with her son. Three and a half years old. Good idea. But the problem was when they called me, they said, Who do you want to ride with? I said, Well, I'm going to bring five people. I need a big Hummer or a big Jeep. Something where the kids can stand up and wave flags. And, you know, this guy from the National Guard showed up with a small Hummer. I said, Where are you going? He said, I'm going to go for Dan or say, That's me. Well, you're going to ride with me. He didn't look any larger than this table. So, anyway, we all. You know, scrunched in. Yeah. So we weren't able to stand up and wave flags and all that stuff. So unknown as the invisible marshal. <laughs> Tom Boy called me and apologized. He said, they brought the wrong vehicle for the damn parade there. I said, well, it's all over with now. Forget it. Snafu. <laughs> Snafu, right. They learned that word last time. <laughs> so I'm on my way overseas, okay? And, uh, <coughs> I want to talk about Guam and Okinawa in that order. Now, did you go to Hawaii at all? Like, did you have to go to oh, Hawaii yeah, and then yeah. So, you, when you went to Pearl, can I just ask you, yeah. it's like two or three years after the attack, did you, did you uh, could you tell that the attack had been there? Did you see? Absolutely. Main? Absolutely. So, what, what did that look yeah. like to you well, as a strong <laughs> Marine? When I, when I got to uh, Oahu, that's where my ship, that's where our ship went, that's where the train went, Oahu. He said they are going to spend a couple of hours touring the island, and you could see. I mean, this was much longer. You know, you could see a lot of damage. Some of the ships were still there in the water. It was such a massive attack, we couldn't possibly gear up to do two things: clear that and fight a war. So they put lesser importance on clearing the channels for the other ships and leaving these other ones go by for a while. You know, so some of those were. Still there two, three years later. Of course, uh, the Arizona. Arizona is still down there. Yeah. That's where we went. We, that's where we went up we to the Arizona. We said our prayer there for those guys. Terrible, terrible thing. There's a guy in South, uh, there's a guy in Queensbury, Frank Copeland. Is he still alive? Yes. I'm going to be with him December 7th. Are you? I'm going to be there. Uh, out in South West Falls. We have a Pearl Harbor Remembrance Day okay. that night. I'm in charge of the program, and Frank is coming over to share it with me. 
Well, both from the Saratogians coming up, you know, that's their story for the day. Uh, is this two of you going to get together? Perfect. Yeah, just the two of us. Uh, uh, Frank Copeland was in Schofield Barracks in Hawaii when I was bombed by the Japanese. <coughs> he was bombed out of the building. He, he, he got wounded, but he didn't get killed. He lives in Queensbury. He kind of hesitant to talk about all this, so he's having trouble. That's why I'm going to be there with him the seventh. We really wanted him to be the one. He, he, his son said he can't get up before people. And, uh -huh. So if someone is with him, he feels comfortable with, he can share some of the stories. I have a story on, I think I gave it to you, didn't I? Before I forget. I don't even have one. No, I don't. Now, did you know Frank before the war? Frank Walton? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We were? No. Not before the war. No. After the after war, the war uh, we both worked at Scott Paper Company here in Port Edward. Yeah. I'll give that to you. That's Frank Walton's story. So you, uh, you had my story. Yeah. So you, um, you're in Hawaii. You're only there for a couple of hours, you say? Or? Uh, where in Hawaii? Yeah. Two days. Two days. Yeah. And then what's next? Uh, uh, I'm more ship. We know we were going to the South Pacific, and we didn't know when we were on the board ship where we were going. We knew we were going to hit an island, but we didn't know where. So what happened was. And one day they called us together, they said, we've got to get the island of Guam back from the Japanese. It's a big island, 38 miles long, and we need that Guam island for our B-29 airplanes. Okay? How many guys are on the ship going over? Oh, about 11 or 12,000. At least. I'm just going to show them the map here. Yeah. So anyway, here's Hawaii, right? Yeah. He's on his way to Guam, yeah. which had fallen to the Japanese shortly after Pearl Harbor. That was ours, and as they're right. stating, we're trying to get it back. There's Guam right Guam, here. Guam, that's Guam, yeah. Okay, so here's the Philippines for context. Where is, where is, where is Okinawa from Guam? Okinawa is up That's here. right. That's where we were. Iwo Jima's in between, right in between yeah. two of them. Yeah. There's Okinawa. Right there. yeah. now, there's, another, there's another island in between Guam and Okinawa called Rota, R O T A. R O T A, yeah. yeah. You see Rhoda? No, maybe it's too small. Is that right? But anyway, tell them about uh, what you're saying. You're on the ship okay. with all these guys. And, uh, um, the troop transport, you said it was a... Uh, about 11,000. 11,000 yeah, guys. It was a USS United States converted luxury liner that we were on. Dan Lawler. Dan Lawler's the other vet that I was telling you about. Yeah, he was on the same ship. First Marine Division. All right. Uh, they gathered us one morning on the ship, and they said, we're going to, Japanese have held Guam for two years now, we've got to get it back. We need it for the, for the B-29s. I don't think anybody realized at the time just what a fierce campaign Guam was. I was one of the, I was in the 11th Marines at the time, which was an artillery battalion, when we hit the beach at Guam. Guam, I think, after 11 days, we secured the island. A lot of fierce fighting, a lot of kamikaze by those Japanese. Uh, I took the, uh, there was a flag raising at the top of the hill on Guam. I took my small brownie camera and I have a photo of the flag raising that's there somewhere. Okay? I think some 9,000 or 10,000 Americans were killed on Guam maybe 30,000 Japanese, dead all over the place. Guam was one fierce campaign. But that didn't wind up. We thought that was the end of the campaigns for the B-29s. Didn't happen. Three weeks, four weeks later, they said, now we're going to go on and take the island of Okinawa from the Japanese. That's their island, and we need that island, which is 68 miles long. This will take care of our B-29s that we need for bombing Japan. Okinawa campaign lasted four weeks. 
That's, that was the fiercest campaign of all of World War II. Maybe 11,000 Americans were killed during that four week period. Almost 100,000 Japanese were killed. Bodies all over the place. And we talked about these guys committing here to carry with a samurai sword, daggers, shot themselves. I, I don't know if I told this group or not, but I brought a sam I took a samurai sword out of a dead Japanese officer, cleaned it up, brought it home. I still have it. I was going to bring it today, just to show you, but my wife said, Dan, that's a damn weapon. You can't bring one to the school. <laughs> right. Otherwise, I would have had my samurai sword right here. But that's how they killed each other. That's what they did. They didn't care. And life was cheap. So anyway, that was the uh, Okinawa campaign. My battalion was uh, chosen to be near the Shuri Castle. I wish I had a photo somewhere about the Shuri, S-H-U-R-I, Shuri Castle on Okinawa, one of the finest things you ever saw in your life, a beautiful, well-built castle way back. Some emperor built it. And they didn't want the Americans, and we were under orders not to touch Shuri Castle. Huge facility, twice as big as this building. Boy, maybe 20 times as big as this building, about four acres long. And so we avoided going to Shuri Castle. But you know what? The Japanese blew it up themselves just to avoid us from taking that. That's what it meant to them. That's where all these, I never said 10,000 Japanese killed themselves around Shuri Castle just to say, hey, take this, you guys, whatever. So that was Surrey Castle. It was a fierce campaign, campaign. A lot of people in caves, very hilly. A lot of our guys got killed badly. And that's, I think, Dan Hawley got wounded on that island. <clears throat> I don't know if you know the name or not, but Jim Butterfield from Glens Falls was out looking out with us. Uh, he's a blind Marine. He's been blind ever since Okinawa. That's where he was, blinded. I was maybe. 100 yards from Jimmy when he got hit. Are you kidding me? Oh, I no. didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Did you know him before the war? Oh, Jimmy went yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. he hit twice that day, didn't he? Yeah, he got hit twice. They evacuated him down. I didn't know that you were near him. Oh, yeah. I, was, I, was, maybe, I didn't hear about him right. until the next day. Wait, wait a minute. Jimmy got blinded. Yeah. yeah. He took him. I don't know. He's a, a, he lived in Hawaii. Yeah, Hawaii. That's what he took him away. Well, Jimmy and I are good friends, always have been. But I didn't know he had gotten wounded. And I was blinded. Yeah. Anyway, Jim and I, uh, when the war was over, we became closer. And we joined him really quarterly. And he had a CNI dog. Uh, we all took, you know. Jimmy, blind, Marine, we'd sit there taking photos. He might be in one of these. Oh! Yeah. Flash blinds me, don't do that. <laughs> Here's the guy blind. He's a character. No, he's a character. Jimmy Waters was like Mary. Mary. Yeah. You know her? Yeah. Oh, they came into class one time. They did? Yeah, they came in with Lawler. Oh, I didn't know. I'm glad you home again. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, Jimmy. Big oh, guy. Is he still doing okay? Or? Huh? Is he still okay? Yeah. Uh, yeah. He doesn't get out much. Yeah. He's, he's okay. Mary does a good job. Mary takes care of him. Mary was his girlfriend. Mary told you the story. He's high school sweetheart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he said, you don't have to marry me. And she said, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> and they're still together. Yeah. That's Jimmy Butterfield. So that he's another guy I would consider a hero. Yeah. As a matter of fact, the real heroes of any war, World War One, World War Two. Korea, Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, the real heroes are those that are buried under those crosses all over the world. Don't ever forget it. They're the ones that were, they're the reason we're enjoying life. I always say, thanks guys, you did a good job. I'm alive because of people like you. And I don't know what the hell would have happened if uh, we hadn't been where we were. Can I ask you a question about Okinawa? Yeah. Do you remember, um, Ernie Pyle. Oh, I have a photo of him there. You didn't meet him. I sure did. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't looked far enough. There's a photo of him. Oh, uh, somebody. 
There's the day after. That's the day after Pearl Harbor right here. But, but you know, off talk about <laughs> All right, so tell us about Ernie Pyle. Ernie Pyle, you know, Ernie Pyle, he, he was a mover and door. He'd go from foxhole to foxhole, <coughs> unit to unit, asking questions. Where are you from? I'm from South Winslow. Where the hell is that? You know? And so I got to know Ernie quite well. And I, like I say now, I'm not boasting, but I was a sergeant major, so they came to me because I was the lead enlisted man out of 25,000 guys. So Ernie would come to me, Dan, i got to find this out. Who's this? Where do I go? Blah, blah, blah. So I got to know Ernie quite well. The day that he got killed, he was talking with it was either Army or Air Force, an Army or a Marine, I can't remember which, I think Marine. He was in a foxhole anyway, and the two of them got killed. Um, Ernie was killed instantly. And everybody, painted. in there somewhere there's a, there's a statue, I don't know if you got the one in there, of Ernie. Oh, right here. No, this is the other one. I want to mention one thing before I forget. Uh, here's, a, here's that photo of Shirley Castle, before and after. <coughs> when I was in Okinawa, I want to mention this, the commanding general of Okinawa was named Lieutenant General Simon Buckner, B-U-C-K-N-E-R, great general. Here's a photo of him with uh, Admiral Spruance and the Rear Admiral Chester Lynn Nimitz, who signed the, along with Doug MacArthur, signed the Instrument of Surrender. There's a copy of the Instrument of Surrender here in one of these books. It's actually a copy of what Douglas MacArthur and Nimitz signed. Two days after this photo was taken on Okinawa, General Buckner was killed. I went to his funeral, and I have a photo here somewhere at his grave. I'm not sure where that is. I had a, when I came home, I was asked to uh, visit his family since I was one of the last survivors of that campaign. So you knew General Buckner too? Huh? You knew him? No, I didn't know the general. No, no I didn't know the general. No, I knew who he was, but I, not on a personal basis, no, I wouldn't say that. No, I knew he had only been over in Okinawa maybe four or five weeks. I, I think you got it there. Yeah, Buckner. Yeah. It shows me there at his grave anyway. And uh, that photo that somebody took of me at his grave, wound up in the stripes. Stars and stripes? Stars and stripes. There's General Buckner right there. That's General Buckner, but there's a different photo. Yep. Right down there, here. That's it. Two days after he's killed, that's when he had his drink. Yeah. That was in Stars and, and Stripes. And uh, after they saw it in Stars and Stripes, his family, Buckner's, wanted me to visit them in West Virginia, their home. So I did. I took a trip to West Virginia and met the Buckner's. In the meantime, he's buried in Okinawa. Two years later, they, they um, disinterred him. Disinterred him. And brought him back to a, he buried in West Virginia. <laughs> yeah, I was invited to go to that, but I never made it. But he's resting in peace now. But he was a great general, and I was proud to be part of it. That photo over there, that's Chiang Kai shek. Chiang Kai shek, president of China. President of China. He gave me an award. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's, there's, there's the flag. There's the flag raising. Flag raising over Guam that he took. I took that one. <laughs> he made the start of the stripes also. He so never became as famous okay. as Ewell. He never Andy became Burton. as famous as Ewell. Andy Rivergen. Oh Say that again. And Ingrid Bergen. You are just all over the place. Where, what, you what name? Berlin? No, you met Ingrid Bergman. Bergman. You, you met Ingrid Bergman. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's, he's like, he's very good. Did she look as angelic like? Oh, we got that was only one night. Ingrid Bergman, that. Betty Grable, Betty Davis, and Janice Page. I danced with each one of them that night. And they all gave me that, gave me their photo. Yeah, this is his picture. Ah, uh, yeah. One of my heroes, Winston Churchill. Yep. So I'm one of the few Marines that is still alive who met 
Roosevelt, Churchill, Chiang yeah, Kai-shek. Right. It's unusual. So, okay, let me bring it back to this, the story of how the war ended. Yeah. Um, you were telling the other class about the USS Indianapolis. Oh, yeah, I'd like to tell them. So tell, tell these guys about that. I have one story they got to finish up with, and I call it my what-if story. Way back in uh, early 1945, the heavy cruiser USS Indianapolis, big, large, second largest ship in the Navy, was in San Diego. And they put two atomic weapons on board that ship. They weren't armed, they were there. That ship sailed to Tinian Island, 6,500 miles away, to deliver those two weapons which they did. They left the atomic weapons at Tinian. When that ship left Tinian Island to go back to the Philippines, halfway back, the USS Indianapolis was torpedoed. 17, 1800 dead immediately. Ships at the bottom of the ocean, 12 or 1500 people dead. About three or 400 in the water struggling to get alive. Nobody in the world knew this. No communications, because they were under orders to run silent, both to and from Tinian. Two days later, a reconnaissance airplane is going by, and they look down there, we see people in the water. Sure as hell, there were two or three hundred survivors struggling to stay in the water, struggling to stay alive, some with limbs, some without legs. The shark got at a lot of the people, killed them a lot. And my one-if story is, what if that the USS Indianapolis had been bombed on the way to Tinian? And that the same thing had happened. Those two bombs would have been at the bottom of the ocean. They wouldn't have been dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Yeah, but that would, have been, that would have lengthened the war by at least two more years. And we would have had to, we would have had to invade Japan. No question about it. We were ready to go anyway. We were all at Okinawa, maybe 50,000 troops in the ship, you wouldn't believe, what was out there in that ocean, ready to go into Japan. And that would have taken us two more days to get there. We were ready for that until we heard about a bombing. So I always said that President Truman made a great presidential decision when he agreed to the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We killed two or three hundred thousand Japanese immediately, no question about it. But they saved millions and millions of lives on both sides. So I credit him with being responsible for any of the war because of those two bombs being dropped. Okay? That, that was my weather story. If that ship had been bombed on the way, or torpedoed on the way, it would have lengthened the war by at least two more years. Have you guys heard about that ship yet? It's in your book, probably in the later chapters, but I just want to call your attention right yep. here. This newspaper article says, Peace are he Peace is here. Japs give up. Here you go, be puppet underneath it. There's a uh, subtitle. Didn't he make a big headline because of the end of the war? It says, USS Indianapolis sunk all aboard casualties, lost in action after delivering atomic bomb parts. <laughs> a little short article about what happened to those guys in the water. Yeah. They were there for at least 48 hours. Going mad from thirst, the sharks were circling, oh, yeah. taking these guys out. But it was a small little story. It was yeah. dwarfed by the end of the war and, and all the other casualties. And then that was, those things went on during the war, nobody knew about it. Nobody knew about it. Boy, after the war, believe me, that became a big story. Yeah. <coughs> the, uh, what's happening about it? Yeah. It's the story of the USS Indianapolis. How'd you wind up in China? You want to finish up with that? Yeah. First Marine Division goes uh, to China. After Okinawa, they uh, decided that the First Marine Division would be sent to China. And when we heard that, what are we going to China for? Well, Chinese nationalists were having a lot of trouble with the uh, Chinese Communists, and they wanted a bunch of money. Uh, First Marine Division to go to the American Embassy in China and kind of act as an in-between, which we did. We had skirmishes, a lot of guys got killed, and we killed a lot of their guys.
So we were at the American Embassy for maybe six months. While I was in China, uh, they gathered, maybe I told the story, they gathered us in Tiananmen Square. Tiananmen Square was at least six acres that way, six acres that way. You wouldn't believe, the, you wouldn't believe the size of the <coughs> square, famous square. There were 25,000 Americans and about 15,000 Chinese all there that day. And the reason was that Chinese president wanted to thank the Americans for being there and uh, doing our share toward the war, toward the Allies. And he took the occasion then to decorate a bunch of Marines and Navy people. I was one of the Marines that he decorated. Called it the Order of the Cloud and Banner. The big thing they wrapped around me, a big copper thing. But in the sort they took a picture of me and they took it off. And we weren't allowed to keep that award and bring it home. The Chinese government wouldn't have any part of that. Anyway, that was uh, there was so much, uh, Tiananmen Square was a great, great place. The same day that the, the President Chiang Kai-shek was there, Madam Chiang was there. She's a U.S. educated lady, <coughs> became Taiwan's first lady. She, she graduated from Walsley College in the United States. She also attended Radcliffe, so, a great lady, I met her on several occasions. She made a habit in China of going to the Red Cross clubs where we were and just you know, moving around, saying hello to everybody, introducing herself. She was that kind of a person. Yeah, shame. Now, are you familiar, well, you must know, E.B. Sledge, Sledgehammer? The guy who wrote this book? Oh, the old read? Oh, oh no. I know who that is, but I, I never knew him, no. no. Lawler knew him. Yeah, Lawler, knew, Lawler was there, that's right. Because he, he served with you in China. This boy, you wrote another book called China Marine. Okay. Yeah. So this is a sledgehammer wrote this book after he wrote with the old breed. I don't think I've ever read that one. Yeah. Well, 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 you're familiar with that one, yeah, right? Yeah. That's where uh, oh. the water was. <coughs> but I'm glad you told me about that. I'll get that guy home. I'll find that. I might have that at home. Yeah. China Marine. All right. You guys have some questions for? For uh, Dan, yeah. we got we have Dan, we have about twelve minutes, so okay. let him ask some questions. I have a bottle of water for you too. Would you like some water? Yeah. <laughs> hey, I'm prepared. <laughs> <laughs> Interviews are hard work. Okay, question. Can we go to Carl Lawrence sometime? <laughs> what? I want to take you to Carl Lawrence as a class trip. Carl Lawrence? Yeah, Carl Lawrence, I want to take you for a class trip with us. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> That'll be on Rosie. <laughs> Yeah, I have a real question. Okay, good. <laughs> I love a real question. Um, like, you're acting like it's no, well, like, you feel like it, it seems like you feel like it's no big deal that you met all those people, but, like, at that time, are you, like, did you feel the same way, that it wasn't really, uh, like, a huge deal that you were meeting these people, like, you know so many of them? I think it's a good nickname. I don't understand your question. Like, at the time that you are meeting these people, did you... I don't know what I'm Do you know what I'm trying to say? Were well, you impressed by these yeah. celebrities as a oh, young Marine? Oh. Yes, yes and no. I didn't know who the hell they were. <laughs> I didn't know who Betty Grable was. Yeah, like I meant, like, yeah. were they as famous as they, like, Well, they introduced them that night out of the canteen. This is Betty Grable, Dan, and this is Betty Davis, and this is uh, Ingrid Bergen. I knew her. <laughs> oh, Jan Janice Page, nice. you know? I didn't know who Janice was either. But after, before I left the same story canteen, I know who they were. So there must have been 5,000 service people there. Big, big event. Big but I didn't realize I was going to be on the stage you know, with those people. Mm -hmm. um, no. I didn't realize at the time just how important that was. You know, 
important to the, uh, they, when, they dress, when they dressed me up as a lady, <laughs> all those Marines out there and those guys, <laughs> they all met me up. Well, <laughs> you know, I wasn't the same after that. He's <laughs> 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 got another question. Uh? Um, you said you talked a lot with President Roosevelt. Um, Say that again. You said you talked a lot with President Roosevelt. Um, what kind of things did you guys talk about? Well, uh, I didn't. We talked, but it was, it was always in a quick. He was moving. Right. He was being wheeled here and wheeled there. You know, he always had it high today. Starting to find. He says, "How's the weather in the Springs?" You know, he was in the big Buick. Fine, for Mr. President. You know, he says. Uh, what was he? He was talking about a dog, Fallon. He liked that dog. <laughs> By the way, in Washington, D.C., if you ever go there and see the uh, uh, FDR Memorial, he got that dog right there. Fallon. <laughs> Don't go out. He, he, he carries that dog with him all the time, and he loved that animal. And uh, I, I thought of that when I went to the Hyde Park and saw the FDR Memorial down there. You know, that's where he's buried, by the way. FDR is buried down there. And uh, visited that place two or three different times just to get a handle on what the hell I was exposed to. You know, didn't realize that. But when you talk with the president, like the night that he gave his uh, day of infamy speech, all I could say that night was thank you, Mr. President, when he was going back. I didn't talk. I didn't get to shake hands again with him. Thank you, Mr. President. He said he went like that. So when you talk with the president. You don't, you don't, unless you're a secretary of state or something, doesn't go along. You know, just quit. And that's the way he wanted it. And that's the way they wanted it. James Roosevelt, his son, and I talked at length. Uh, you know about, and Jim, his son, James Roosevelt, came to me one time. He said, "You know, he likes you, Dan." And then Roosevelt, but I, I had six strikes and I always saluted sharply and well. And that was his uh, the, the little White House in Orange Springs, Georgia, was his place to relax. When he went down there, he did that. And that's where he died. That's where he died. I know exactly where he died. I know the chair he was sitting in when this lady was taking the photo, of Megan, you know, the, the official the painting of him. Never been seen. They don't do it anymore. He's, it's out of sight. He didn't complete it. That's where he had an attack, and he just died in that chair. And uh, I, I know the chair, and I know how I felt bad about that. And uh, so did uh, Mr. Truman when he heard about it. Yeah. And that's another story of Mr. Truman. He had to make a monumental decision in the short time he was president. And he knew what he was doing when he approved the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And when he signed the, when he signed the order, he says, this ought to bring the war to an end. I don't want to do it this way, but let's do it. That We've got to end this war. He did it. It ended the war. He took some shellacking for it from some people, but uh, I, I think he made the right decision. I didn't want to go into Japan. It would have been another two years, another million people didn't kill. Nobody wanted any part of that. And we had to retaliate somewhat. So he did it. I just bought him. Um, do you think a majority of people that um, were in the service would agree with you that they were glad that um, that we dropped the bombs? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I guess so. You talked to any Marines, huh? You talked to anybody who was in the Pacific. Yeah. Any other, anybody who yeah. was in, you talk to anybody who served in the Pacific. <coughs> you see, all of, uh, we had 185,000 people dead by then. Our own people, you know, a million plus Japanese dead, plus Germans and everything else. We had to stop that war. And Truman's decision to stop the war, no question about it. And we were ecstatic. Think about it. We, you know, we felt well, sorry somebody had to get killed. Now, I think the Japanese people themselves realized uh, Hirohito, Hirohito wrote a book. And in it, somewhere along the line, he said the United States made the correct decision in bombing. Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They had their reasons to do it, and their reasons were correct. We were at war. We were the ones who started by bombing Pearl Harbor. They had to end the war this way. And sorry, but that's the way it was. But even Hirohito had a thought there. You know. 
I never met, I never met him, by the way. I met enough people. Nice people. Know. Hey, I'll tell you what, it's been nice talking with you guys. I hope a little bit of the history on that, those newspapers. Maybe there's something different here. I don't know. Or whatever. I appreciate being here. Have you been asked? And I always think about looking forward to being a great place to be. I especially liked uh, that Hall of Fame induction that was at. It was a great event. They did a great job. Matt was part of that. <laughs> Heather's, Heather has introduced. Who was it you introduced? Mr. Jardin. Oh, yeah. That's right, too. Mr. Rosal yeah. organized Yeah. Yeah. They did a good job. Yeah. <laughs> Let's have a hand for Dan. Thank you. And uh, can they come up and look at the book? Absolutely. Come on up. Shake his hand. You've got to be one person waiting for us to